start my recording as well. And I'm gonna mute myself and Amanda. Great, hey, well, hello everyone. Good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the exciting launch event for the Health and Environment Policy and a Wellbeing Economy paper. Um, so this paper is a part of our policy design series. Um, and can you switch, Isabel? Um, and it is came about where I began with We All about a year ago as the knowledge and policy lead in March of 2020. And at the time, very much We All's aim was to answer the questions what is a well-being economy and how do we get there? And so we were working on this idea of synthesis papers, but then obviously this pandemic hit and it felt really important that we not just synthesize existing ideas and solutions that were out there, but also support some thought leadership in terms of how do we really conceptualize, understand and respond to this pandemic um, in terms of our economic recovery initiatives and policies. And so with that, sort of understanding in mind, we thought about developing a We All policy paper series this past year that would help to outline principles and potential policies for um, economic recovery efforts towards a well-being economy. And I think it was almost exactly one year today that I had a call with Iwa, um, a brilliant economist who I'll introduce in a moment. And he said, you know, we really honestly with this pandemic, need to take seriously the intersections between health and the environment and really think about what that means in terms of our structural transformation and our economic policies. And I said, well, Iwa, that sounds incredible. Would you be willing to maybe lead a paper that explores this? And he said, sure. Yeah, let's do it. And so these policy paper series is an experiment for we all in co-creation. As a membership-based organization, we're an alliance of organizations, activists, academics, and change makers from all over the world. And our aim is to connect across silos to co-create content and knowledge that can help to accelerate the necessary shifts in our economic system. And so as part of that, um, the idea was to bring together our membership, again, across disciplines and silos to explore really tricky topics like this um, and to come together and to create something more than each of us could as individuals. And so with that, I would love to introduce sort of the team that ended up coming together to develop this paper. So we put a shout out to the membership, said who would be interested in exploring the intersections between health and the environment. Um, and we ended up having an incredible group of individuals volunteer and step forward to work together over the past year. And so Iloa, who is an economist at Sans Po, it was the lead author of this initiative. And he's gonna be speaking today and providing an overview of the paper and the context, as well as speaking to important reforms that are necessary in the energy sector in order to promote the well-being and health of our people and planet. And then we have Gio, who is um, the director of the Swedish organization and the health expert is really interested in these intersections between health and the environment and was speaking to the healthcare sector and really about the importance of mitigation and prevention when we think about um, how to promote the well-being of people. And then we have Raluca, who is a master's student at the Royal Institute of Technology and a climate activist. And she's going to be looking at the um, sector of food and how we can transform our systems of production and consumption in food for health and well-being. And Fabio, um, who is doing his PhD on the politics of well-being, and he's going to be speaking about the really important social aspects of cooperation and how we really think about reforming our social systems in order to um, maximize this nexus. And then finally, Ale, um, who is a macroecologist and sustainability specialist, is going to be speaking around education, right? So ways in which we even learn and conceptualize of these intersections and these topics, and then is going to be introducing a really special guest we have today, Lorenzo Fiamonte, who is one of the original visionaries and architects of We All. And then we'll have time to discuss all of us together um, this really exciting topic. So with that, I'll hand it over to Iwa to dive into the paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. It is a real pleasure and uh, 
a relief also to, uh, to finally get there. It took us a while, but it was an organic process. And I think that we enjoyed, I think the secret of this, of this group was really how much we enjoyed working with one another and making progress with a, a simple idea, with, which was the point of departure of the paper. And the, the simple idea was the intuition that, you know, in crises, you see things more clearly. This is one of the virtues of crisis is that all of a sudden you realize that uh, there are some things that really, really pop up. And I, I guess the original idea was just that uh, the COVID crisis uh, lays bare the fact that the, uh, the backbone of uh, human well-being is the health environment nexus. And so with this very simple idea, the, the, the point was trying to, to work on this idea of a connection, which really forms the backbone of human well-being. And then uh, the other idea, original idea of the paper was to work and to build on the work by Kate Raworth, which is the donut economy. And the idea that you need to add um, a ceiling to um, a social ceiling, a social floor, sorry, to the ecological ceiling. And the thing with this design of those two circles is that in a way, those circles don't seem to communicate with one another. They don't seem to be related to one another. And you don't see the, the, the nods of connection between the two circles. And so the idea was to try to build something to connect the circles and hence the idea of the social ecological feedback loop. So how to connect two circles, maybe well design a feedback loop whereby you are going to connect social circles with natural circles. So this was the idea. And, uh, and then uh, the team really, really worked on, so we had a call with uh, Jackie McBlade uh, in the fall, and she said, I like the idea of the social ecological loop, but I feel trapped in the loop. And so the, the talent of Joe was really to open the loop and to try to, to build uh, these little coffee beans that you see where you have the two sides, uh, the social sides and the natural sides. And the idea is that they come from the social uh, ecological feedback loop. So the, the, the organic work was that each member of the team really added to this idea and, and really opened this vision so that it became uh, this, this idea that we, we need the very foundation, the natural foundations of our well, of our well being, which is of course food, energy, uh, health, and then uh, and then the the pillars of social cooperation. And so this um, representation is really making a connection between, on the one hand, ecological interdependence, and on the other, social cooperation, which I think are the two fundamental realities of human prosperity on the planet. And so with that, we really uh, started uh, working uh, in uh, September, October, and uh, ended up uh, with the paper. So I think we can now move to the, yeah. Yes, thank you, Eloan, for the introduction. Um, yes, so I think uh, we start from the first area that we cover, which obviously is healthcare. Um, and I think with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we actually um, realized that the this importance and as, um, of having a good healthcare, but also a healthcare that is accessible. Um, but the other thing we realize is that we need to invest in prevention because prevention saves lives, uh, but also public spending. And so this was kind of a conversation that we had about healthcare and what, what we mean by healthcare. And what we realized is that we need to invest in prevention and mitigation within the healthcare system, but also outside. Uh, and here there's a few examples of how how we are already doing that in some extent. And this is also covered in the paper by our case studies. And for example, in healthcare, unfortunately, uh, the healthcare sector generally produce a very big amount of plastic waste, but this plastic waste is generally incinerated. So it's not recycled. And this contributes to 4.4% of global CO2 emission, which is quite, a quite a big amount. Um, so there are actually places where we are trying to improve this and we should 
learn from them. And one case studies we present is from the University Hospital in Lanchester in UK. And what they have done is basically just simply adding a recycling bin in a surgery room uh, to reduce this incinerating waste. And they reduce it by 60%. Uh, but this is just one example. And there are much more that we can do in order to improve our healthcare. So it doesn't have a strong impact on the environment because that kind of comes back to us. So if we impact our environment through our healthcare system, that will also impact our health. And so it's kind of a loop that doesn't end. So we need to really invest into um, actions that uh, really focus on reducing the uh, healthcare sector impact on the environment. And also we need to look at outside the healthcare sector because there are so many things that we are doing, uh, the way society is built that are impacting our health. Uh, and this is generally through the environment. So the way that we impact the environment then obviously impacts our health. And one example is traffic and it's like hair pollution in cities, for example, which is one of the main uh, reason for death and illnesses in many countries. And we can think about big cities like Delhi, uh, where during the pandemic was even worse uh, the situation because of this uh, disease getting worse when you have uh, air that is not clean. Uh, but there are improvements in, in different places. And we uh, bring up the case of London, for example, with ultra low emission zones. And they were able through this, the creation of these zones uh, to reduce uh, the concentration of, of uh, nitrogen dioxide of 29%. Um, and this is like a first step to create a better air quality in cities. And there are plans also in Amsterdam and Paris, but we need to expand this further and going beyond just the big cities. Um, Another thing that we uh, talk about in the paper related to uh, prevention is actually an again, uh, kind of we draw this from the COVID-19 experience, is uh, the problem with um, not having a good health literacy among people. Uh, and we realize that we need everybody, not just the health professional, to have a good understanding of what health, the concept of health is, and how to improve and maintain our health. Uh, and so um, we, for example, bring the example of Finland, when, where the health literacy is part of the education system, and we think that this should be a compulsory subject in every country, because this not just improve, um, you know, the response in emergency situation, like in the case of the pandemic, of people knowing exactly what they have to do, so we don't have to explain that they have to wash their hands, but also in general, they can improve the way they approach life and they approach society and what they do in their daily life and that will have an impact not just on their health and the health of others but also in the public spending around healthcare. But now I would, to, I would like to pass the word to Raluca which will cover another important uh, aspect connected to health and the environment which is the food industry. Um, hi, uh, yes yeah, so our second focus area is food and as many of us know the food industry um, and and uh, including the agricultural sector and the animal industry in particular, is a major source of environmental damage. Um, so the animal industry sector in particular is responsible for methane emissions, for deforestation, desertification, loss of biodiversity, and others. Um, we know from numerous studies that a reduction in meat intake would reduce environmental impact while also decreasing the incidence of preventable disease, which includes most heart disease, diabetes, and stroke, um, which are major causes of mortality and morbidity in the West. Um, and yet no country has implemented any policy to significantly affect meat consumption. Um, however, we do know that multiple countries have successfully implemented taxes on consumables like um, stimulants like tobacco and alcohol. And Denmark has successfully implemented a tax on saturated fat. Um, and we also know from recent models that a meat tax would be a feasible strategy. Um, in addition to the potential for wellness that low emission plant-based foods hold, our paper discusses the widespread wastage of food at all stages of the food cycle. Unfortunately, one third of all food um, that is produced ends up not being eaten. Um, and in addition to the extensive natural resources that go into food production, including energy, water, and land, Wasted food is also a source of emissions, and I think we can all agree that food is better suited to reach people who would actually like to eat it. Um, in February 2016, France enacted Loi Garot, 
making it illegal for supermarkets to throw away edible food and instead diverting it to organizations working with underprivileged groups. Italy followed suit with a similar law in 2016 and in Sweden and Denmark, NGOs are working hard to recirculate food surplus back into the community. Um, but we really need a proper infrastructure and wider support if we, if we want to achieve these environmental and wellness goals that we all are striving for. Uh, that's, thank you. Uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, the next area is energy. This is an obvious one, all right? So we, we can say that the, the, the global energy system is irrational from the point of view of human well-being. It's 80% fossil, it's uh, destroying human uh, well-being, and yet it is the same percentage of fossil fuels than basically 40 years ago. And we know much more about the destruction, the destruction caused by fossil fuels. So this is just, it's not, it's not a question of right or wrong. It's a question of just being completely rational with respect to uh, a system where we could harness uh, the, 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 the power of natural elements and we are not doing this. And because of our laziness, we are basically destroying human well, uh, well-being. And of course, we can see that there are huge co-benefits. This is one of the key concepts of the paper, by the way, uh, to, to move from cost-benefit analysis, which has done so much harm from mainstream uh, economics in the last 30 years uh, to the analysis of environmental issues, to move from cost-benefit to co-benefits. And one of the key co-benefits, of course, is the co-benefit from air pollution. In France, my country, we have 100,000 people dying each year from air pollution. In India, it's 1.3 million people per year. In uh, India, it's 1.5 million people per year. And so getting rid of fossil fuel means getting rid of those uh, life that are uh, prematurely lost. So this is a net gain. And of course, it's also building resilience because we know, for instance, that air pollution is responsible for almost 20% of death from COVID because of comorbidities. So if we want to build this social shield that we need to face those ecological shocks that are coming, uh, we need to take advantage of those co-benefits. And this is a key message from the paper to think in terms of co-benefits. Uh, and, 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 and of course we know that, for example, the deployment of renewable energy is an extremely uh, uh, um, profitable economic opportunity if you account things in the right way. You know the 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 the, the old joke from uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, who was asked uh, by a journalist to uh, define the state of the USSR in one word, and he said good. And then the journalist said, okay, and what about two words? And he said not good. So the real question is, how many words do you have to describe the situation? And accounting is really about that. If you count things only in monetary terms, you're going to miss uh, essentially the whole point of accounting. And if you account things in terms of health, in terms of well-being, then of course you are going to see a much wider picture and which is the right picture actually. Next slide, please. Okay, so social cooperation is also something that I, I wanted uh, to be in the paper uh, because I think that two key factors in uh, uh, the acceleration of transition policy is really first, uh, the reduction of social inequality. So within this health environment nexus, you have a sustainability justice nexus. The, the fact that if we, it makes social sense to mitigate our environmental crisis and it makes environmental sense to mitigate our social crisis. If you think about the beginning of the 21st century as really uh, the century of the twin crisis of inequality and the crisis of the biosphere, then you need to mitigate both actually to make progress uh, on, on, uh, on both uh, on both fronts. Uh, yeah, I will. I, okay, I, I'm just talking about the beginning uh, of the the first slide, and I will I will, uh, I will let Fabio talk about uh, uh, the the move food experience. So just to to wrap uh, this up, uh, the question of, for example, how do you design carbon taxes? is extremely important. And we saw with uh, Switzerland a few days ago that if you don't include social compensations in carbon taxation, uh, people are going to reject those. But on the contrary, if you, uh, if you do uh, uh, include social compensation and the question of social justice, then you have a chance to accelerate those transition policy. And Fabio, uh, I will uh, let you discuss the, um, the, the next case study. No, actually, it's the same slide. No, actually, Sorry. yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, it's the same slide. And actually, I, I think, I hope it doesn't sound too pretentious, but I think that this is actually the most uh, important one uh, of all. And the, the, the reason why I believe that is because uh, if we agree that climate change is a man-made problem, then we need to look at those men and women that are uh, contributing to that problem uh, if we want them uh, to address that. In other words, we need to have them on board. And this is what this uh, part about social cooperation is really all about. And um, when we say that we want to promote a healthy environment and an environment that in, turns, that in turn promotes uh, healthy lives, um, underlying that, what we're suggesting is that the, um, I mean, the aim is to work for the community. But we also stress this in the, what we also stress in the paper is that it's also important to work with the community. And Eloa mentioned the case of British Columbia and the car carbon tax that was rejected that, but perhaps the most important uh, evidence uh, that we have comes from Scotland and this small organization called Moo Food, Moo standing for Moo of Ord, which is a small town uh, up in the uh, Scottish Highlands. And they uh, have been uh, putting up wooden boxes all around the village uh, where people can grow their vegetables and fruit. And then they also have an orchard, which is for the community and run by the community. They plant trees that can take fruit, uh, fruit, uh, vegetables for free, um, which by the way, as Eloa was, uh, Eloa was also stressing, uh, doesn't actually contribute to GDP. And from a GDP standpoint, uh, it, it generate no value because there's no monetary transaction involved. Um, but it does contribute to their health and to the uh, pr promotion of a healthy environment. And uh, to, 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 to go back to what Eloa said at the beginning about the fact that we see things more clearly in times of crisis, in August 2020, um, a community fridge that Move Food put up in the, um, in the center of the small town um, uh, actually saw an increase, a uh, very big increase in the, in, in, in the amount of food that people were living and in the amount of food that people were taking, which helped save uh, more than 400 kilos of waste, which was of, uh, almost a 600% increase compared to the same of previous years. So uh, this social cooperation is even more important perhaps in time in times of crisis. And I'm gonna hand it over with that now to Ali, who is, uh, is going to talk about uh, education. Thank you so much, Fabio. Uh, so education is the fifth area that we have discussed in the, in the paper. And I will just, <clears throat> like to say that these five uh, are, of course, not the only five areas. Uh, we know for sure that there are many other areas that should be um, and investigated with this uh, co-beneficial approach between health and environment, such as mobility, housing, recreation, and culture. But we, we picked this five one because uh, we have seen these are areas in which uh, changes are substantial and within reach. So. The idea with education, uh, we argue in the, uh, in the paper, is that we need to um, rethink the entire uh, education system for the long and short term health of communities. Now, what do we mean exactly and what are we uh, in need to rethink. Uh, I would like to stress three points that we have made in the, uh, in the paper. The first one is the need to uh, reconsider the relationship in between uh, education and health. Now, usually we believe that people, well, let's say in, in public policies, um, the approach is that people with more years of schooling tend to have healthier life. But we have also seen increasingly in research that health and nutrition are themselves, let's say, enabling factors for, uh, for youths uh, to uh, uh, have educational uh, achievements. And on top of these, educational attainment is the single strongest predictor of climate change awareness. So this is contributing, let's say, to uh, the, the health of the planet as well. So education with a link with, with both human health and, uh, and planetary health. The second change that is necessary, uh, we summarized, has a shift from a critical, uh, well, say, from the accumulation of knowledge to 
critical thinking. The, the current education system that we have um, is mostly focused at preparing people for the job market. It is really growth uh, oriented and is uh, again, let's say, pushing the same uh, model that has put us in the uh, crisis that we are facing uh, so far. Uh, so we believe and, and we uh, show with the three case studies that we have included in the, in the paper that there are new ways of educating uh, people um, that can basically allow a fundamental concept uh, such as sustainability, for instance, to be um, endogenized, to be realized by students rather than imposed by uh, educators. And the third and final uh, shift, if you want, that we are explaining or calling for in the, uh, in the paper is a shift from having education as center around just a mere teaching of theories, uh, shift towards a more experiential learning approach. We have seen that the Western education has been exported in many parts of the world, contributing in these many parts of the world to, uh, let's say, the loss of the social fabric, the loss of local knowledge. So we are uh, showing with examples that more time should be spent outside classrooms uh, so that we can learn from nature and learn in nature. And more and more uh, studies are showing the positive benefits, not just in terms of gaining awareness and education, but also in gaining mental and physical health uh, of being uh, within nature and learning within, uh, within nature. So <clears throat> with this, we finish the uh, quick, let's say, list of the five areas that we have discussed. As I said, um, we believe that the health environment co-beneficial approach can be expanded to other areas as well. And we would like now to uh, start a discussion with our guest. Um, before I had prepared a long uh, introduction, but then I see in the initial chat that everyone knows each other and it's like a family reunion that is going on uh, right now because indeed uh, Lorenzo, um, is taking a sabbatical from uh, his uh, professorship position uh, at the University of Pretoria, and he was one of the starter of the uh, We All Alliance. So he is back uh, in the family. I think, um, I mean, probably you all know the two recent books that he has uh, published, Wellbeing Economy, Success in a World Without Growth, and then The World After GDP, Economics, Politics, and International Relations in the Post-Growth Area. But I think for us, uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Lorenzo with us because uh, in his position of former Minister of Education, University, and Research, he has had, let's say, the pleasure or maybe the burden, I don't know, of having to deal with these areas, not only from a, from a scientific research viewpoint, but also as a public administrator. So he has at least tackled uh, two of the five areas that we have um, listed in our paper with his work. And so it's really um, with pleasure that we would like to hear from him on the importance of this health environment relationship. And the first question uh, for him is, how do you think um, that um, the, the, the argument, the co-benefit argument that we have put forward in this uh, policy paper helps uh, the beyond GDP and the well-being transition. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, okay, now you can see me at least. Um, thank you so much for, for inviting me. It's, uh, it's really beautiful to see um, how far we've gone. You know, um, with, with some other, you know, some other colleagues and some of the people in the call here, um, I remember in 2014, 2015, we were wondering, you know, like, how do we, how do we concretely make people understand that our economic system is fundamentally wrong and we need to rethink what we mean by growth, we need to rethink what we mean by development, and, and we were all wondering, you know, like, what is, what is a concept that beautifully captures uh, an alternative to, you know, to this system of production and consumption? And we all agree that well-being was, was a very, very powerful one. First of all, it's easy to understand. It's translated in languages. The art of living well is something that anyone can understand. And, and this connection between the environment and health, you know, our personal, I mean, if you think about it, you know, what's personal development at the end of the day, if it's not living in good health? 
right? Mental health, physical health, uh, social health, everything. You know, the quality of our social connections is so important. And at the same time, we're a part of ecosystems, right? We're in it. You know, we're not, you know, in relationship with ecosystems. We are, you know, part, integral part of ecosystems. And so the health of the environment is our health in, in a sense. And I think you're, the way you've depicted it with, um, you know, those two circles connecting to each other is um, a strong step forward compared to the donut. Uh, I think one of the main, um, you know, limits of the donut, and, and, uh, and I commend Kate Rayworth for having done a very good job at, at giving a tool, a practical tool to public administrators. Uh, but it's that it sees the two things, the social the social floor and the planetary boundaries as two disconnected things. You have to stick in the middle. Yeah, it gives you this idea that you have to limit yourself. You know, you have to you have to try and not do too much, not do too little. But that is wrong, right? We ambition to have good and fulfilling lives. So it, it's not captivating to know that you know you need to stay within something. You need to know how to expand your well-being. You know, you need to have a system that says we continuously grow in well-being. You know, you, you never stop living well. You know, you can always live a bit better. You can all, you, you always learn new things. Um, and I think so. The well-being economy approach is, is very powerful, and it goes very well beyond GDP. I mean, this this massive misunderstanding. You know, that we have created a system of measurement. I think Eloa was mentioning it uh, earlier. You know, like. Um, if we don't do your accounting well, you take the wrong decisions. You know, if you think, uh, you know, if you're looking at the wrong indicators that indicate you the wrong pathway, you're going to end up doing the wrong things. And this is precisely what has happened. I mean, there is no scientific, no serious scientific proof that you know the more you increase your GDP, the better you are. You could actually um, get in a very today, for instance. I, 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 I saw, I don't know, this piece of news that in, in Greece, in order to revamp the economy after COVID, to have increased the working week, to the, the, the working day to 10 hours a day from eight. While many other countries are considering reducing, you know, uh, the working working activities during working hours during during the day and during the week, you know, the Greeks are going in the opposite direction. There's this obsession um, that doesn't understand this fundamental point, you know, the, the idea of co-benefits. We are missing the point. We're not measuring things correctly. We don't see benefits. We're only looking at things in terms of costs. And of course, when you take that approach, it seems that doing the right thing is always too expensive. Um, and it isn't, because doing the right thing cannot be too expensive. It isn't too expensive. It produces a lot of benefits. It produces a lot of profits. Think of replacing the word profits with the word benefits. It's it's a it's a revolution, you know. Like like, you know, that profits are just monetized, but benefits are immense. Not getting sick, not getting sick is like getting a profit, right? If you don't have to spend money to cure myself, to you know, to treat myself, it's like making money. Having good social connections means it, it's equivalent of actually making money. You make money, you're making profits, but you do not see them because they're not. In, in, in with the same nature, um, in the same quality of, of what the economy measures a term, as in terms of GDP and growth. So I think, I think this, this goes really in the right direction. It makes a strong argument, especially post COVID for taking health seriously, but not just your physical health, your mental health, social health, environmental health as, as a way to proceed as a social economy. And I think the examples you make are extremely useful. And I can tell you, there are many more examples, some of them even, the, even at the macro level that you can find all over the world. And, um, and when I was a minister, I, I, you know, I did this. I, it wasn't easy. Maybe you can talk about it later. Uh, it would take a long time, but it's not easy to do this in, in a society which is still obsessed with certain categories and certain language where the media is fundamentally obsessed with a certain worldview, saying something that we all intuitively understand and scientifically is proven. And, and we can, you know, we can mention dozens and dozens of papers that all say the same thing. It's still quite hard when you become a policymaker. That's why it is so important to have a positive language, to have a language that doesn't talk about contraction, doesn't talk about restrictions, doesn't talk about, you know, you know, de you know, un underdevelopment, doesn't, it doesn't project an image of of doing less but it's doing more of a different quality i say rather than a battle between more or less it's a better for better uh thank you very much lorenzo um we have another question for you which is more practical uh so we were actually wondering how do you think policymakers, and in your case more specifically in italy because that's more your experience uh, can use this paper so how, how would be put in practice? 
uh, it's very much in line with what uh, with what I was saying. Um, policy. Okay, you need to understand this. I also wasn't aware until I became one of them. Policymakers need catchy titles, so they don't have time to study. So you need to give them something which is easy to understand, and it has a language that can be reused. Reused often in political, uh, in, in 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 public debates. Public debates don't give you time to go in depth. You cannot put references, you can't, you need to be catchy, you need to make your argument uh, extremely clear cut. Um, so I think your paper does that, does that in terms of its uh, illustrations. Illustrations are, are quite useful to give you an idea, to give you a very basic idea. The economy we're talking about, it's an expansive economy. The economy we're talking about is not an economy that gives up, but an economy that gains. It's an economy about, you know, a different idea of of what it means to be a successful society. This is very important. It's very hard for politicians to go out there and say to people, guys, we need to do less. Guys, we need to try and avoid doing that. Guys, we need to try and you know contract. That's very hard. So your, 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 your message is a positive message, forward looking. This is very, very important. I say this also to we all, let's keep working on this forward looking language. Secondly, you give them a lot of numbers and, and things they can look at. It's not enough to say, hey, an economy is, is you know, it's better to live in an economy and an economy that doesn't do this and doesn't do that and diminishes um, the negative impacts and so on and so forth. That's not enough. You need to show them exactly how much is that worth. And I think we're doing it with, uh, you know, with your co-benefits analysis by showing precisely how much value is lost in doing the wrong things. In the mainstream economy, the mainstream economy is a stupid economy. It's an inefficient economy. Uh, the well-being economy is a much more efficient economy. It's a much more innovative one. So I, I think by doing this, by using tools that are easy to understand and give them strong economic arguments to win a public debate, whether on TV or uh, in, in, in the press, I think you're, 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 you're doing something very valuable and, and also helping those like me that are often feel like we're, you know, we're far and few, few and far between, uh, very lonely and and have to convince the masses, have to convince millions of people that this is the way to go. And I think having this incredible, you know, strong wealth of information is extremely useful. And I think in, in countries like Italy, this is going to be quite, and, and I want to commend you also on having written uh, versions of this paper for uh, our national media, national newspapers, uh, really useful. To, to get the concept of well-being into constant political conversation. Of course, you haven't mentioned we go, the countries, Scotland, Finland, Iceland, Wales, and New Zealand that are doing so much in this regard. Every time there is a positive example, a politician can say, look, what I'm saying is not just you know, a fabrication of my intellect, but it's what is happening right there. If it's happening in New Zealand, why couldn't it happen here? If it's happening in Italy, why couldn't it happen there? So I think bringing all this information together is extremely useful for policymakers. And then you have to go out there and try and get the policymakers that don't want to listen and to try and listen with these um, supported by these arguments. Thank you so much, um, everyone for sharing. Um, yeah, Lorenzo, that was uh, very informative. I, I appreciated a lot of what you just said. We, for the next 20 minutes, are going to open up for a Q and A. Um, so how that's going to work is I'm going to sort of field some questions. Um, if you feel comfortable opening up your mic and your video, um, just you can use the little on the bottom of the screen, there's a little reaction, and you can use a little raise hand function, um, or you may physically raise your hand, or you may also write a question in the chat. So whatever suits your fancy. I know that, um, Yannick, you wrote a question earlier, and I'm not sure if you want to sort of kick us off with that, and then we can have the conversation flow from there. I would just ask that both the those that are asking the questions and those that are answering the questions keep your answers and questions tight uh, so we can get as many as we can in the next 20 minutes. Thanks so much. Yeah, and I'm not there. Hi, everybody. I'm Yannick. Um, hi, Lorenzo. It's great to see you again. I think last time was in South Africa. It's fantastic. Uh, um, how much the world has changed since then? I think my question is just the last part, really, of what I wrote. Sorry, I had to write because I was so walking, uh, and so now I'm back. I really wanted to catch this cut, this uh, this whole presentation. So just asking a bit about worldview. So we're still stuck a lot in trying to find solution pathways to health, environment, sustainability, all these other things. 
using the kind of values and beliefs of the worldview that kind of cost the issues in the first place. In Europe, it's a bit more challenging. I can sort of see that there's not necessarily access or collab direct collaborations potential with indigenous worldviews, for example. Canada, New Zealand, Australia do have those collaboration pathways. So I'm just wondering how do we maybe uh, make space for completely different ways of thinking when it comes to looking for solutions, um, especially relational, less quantitative uh, with policymakers and candidates starting, starting to crack the wall. Just wondering your thoughts on, on uh, bringing in different ways of knowing into the conversation. Okay, I can try to answer this. Um, I think that mainstream economics, I think when we are talking about you know, the policy debates, around the question of health and environment. This is not a theoretical moment to ask those questions. I think we are right in the middle of a huge battle of ideas that might unfold next September, October with the IUCN summit and then the COP15 in China, which is what is the best way to preserve biodiversity and ecosystems. And I think that you have with the Dascupta review and with the UN meeting on national accounts, a view that if you are doing cost benefits in the you know, uh, right way with the proper tools, et cetera, you are going to be able to monetize ecosystem services and biodiversity, factor those into green GDP, and then you are going to preserve ecosystem and biodiversity. This is something that is actually gaining momentum right now in international circles. And I think contrary to that, you have another view, which is, which is basically the one that we defend in the paper, even if we don't do it explicitly, which is that it's a matter of social cooperation and biodiversity and ecosystem. In other words, uh, the report by the FAO on the role, the key role of indigenous communities in preserving biodiversity and ecosystems, which is a completely different view of how we could preserve biodiversity and ecosystem with this diversity of modes of social cooperation and governing the commons, to borrow from Elinor Rosdahl, right? And you have this also in the IBES report, the, the global assessment report by the IBES in 2019, which puts really forth the role of indigenous communities in preserving ecosystems and biodiversity. So in a way, what you are saying is that I think the view, the homogenous view, which doesn't account for the diversity of human communities around the world is pretty much the mainstream economics that we are fighting uh, actually in the paper. And when we are talking about co-benefits and the role of social cooperation, we are really echoing this idea that probably the best stewards around the world for biodiversity and ecosystems actually in the indigenous communities. Uh, raw and build green GDP. But I think this is a battle that is ongoing, actually. Um, thank you, Ilva. Gio, I thought also you might have something to add, and I wanted to sort of give you the floor. If you had any response, you can pass, but um, yeah, Yes, I saw Fabio actually raising the hand, so I don't know if he wants to say something first, maybe. He's going to ask a question. He already messaged me, sorry. All right. Uh, no, I just wanted to say about uh, education because that's one of we or one of the things that we cover in the paper, and for us, it was very important to cover this area because sometimes I think it's a bit overlooked. We kind of feel that the, the our education system, talking about the Western education system, it's good that we are providing all the informations that people needs to uh, have. But as Ali explained, it's very much related to creating human beings for the job market and not to re and disconnecting them actually from nature. And that's a big problem. So I think education has a very important role. So the way we understand education, what type of education we provide to people, that's very important. And that will change also the way people view the world. And, and I think that's something that we really need to invest in. I, I, and, I mean, come back to Lorenzo. I mean, he has tried to do some work in Italy exactly on this. So I don't know if he has a comment on that, but I think education is, and I would say education in schools, but we should uh, kind of remember that education doesn't end with the schools. I think it's a constant process. So how, how are we gonna address education also in the workplace? And uh, you know, it's something also important to maybe have a discussion on. Thank you, Gio. Um, I'm gonna go to Fabio for a question. And then um, Lorenzo, if you have a response to that, he's gonna ask uh, you a question. 
Okay, thank you, Isabel. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I've got a, a bit of a challenging question for Lorenzo. Um, so what, what we know and we say all the time, you know, and we, we stress it today as well, is that we produce a lot of plastic, we produce too much plastic, and therefore we should reduce the amount of plastic that we consume, uh, but also the amount of plastic that we produce in the first place. And we also know that we should be flying less and taking the train instead or avoid flying altogether, um, that we should reduce meat and so on. Uh, and, and the key word here is reduce, is less, um, because there's too much, therefore we should um, have less and we should reduce the production of certain goods or services. And um, in, if we frame it in terms of goods and services, that's kind of fine, but we could also frame that in terms of jobs. So we could also say, well, actually what we're saying is that there should be less people than currently working in the plastic industry, and there should be less people that currently are working in the aviation industry and in the meat industry. Um, so from the policymakers' perspective, and especially from an elected politician's uh, point of view, um, isn't that the fight against climate change and the fight for a well-being economy a sort of war loss from the end, from, 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 the, from the outset, from the very beginning? It's a provoking kind of challenging question, but I'd like to hear what you think about it. Thank you, Fabio. Um, uh, do, do you guys hear me? I, I don't see my face, so um, just just nod if you if you hear what I'm saying. Um, uh, you, you, is that okay? We can, can hear you hear me? Because I'm. Yeah, then, yeah, oh, sorry, can, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's why we need a positive. That's it, it is a very hard job. Okay, I don't know how many of you know what happened to me when I was in government. And when I was in, I, I started in 2018, and I decided that I was going to be a well-being politician, right? And I said it from the very outset. I took stance against uh, our national oil company, saying that it needed to change altogether immediately. That, and my argument was that the oil company was actually taking wealth away from Italy, right? You know, because usually, usually the, the main argument is, how can you say that the oil company is a national asset? That's how you they call it, right? And I would use the numbers exactly like you did to show that it wasn't that wasn't the case that the whole company was actually causing more damage, more disbenefits than 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 profit, and we simply were not measuring the disbenefits. And then, of course, if that is the case, let me tell you, even Pablo Escobar was a great uh, corporate leader. I mean, he, he he made a lot of money. Of course, it was causing disbenefits. But if you don't measure the disbenefits, then the same applies to the mafia, to anything. Any drug lord would actually be a good entrepreneur in that regard. So, and that was. That then I took issue against, I took my stance against uh, food production and uh, the junk food industry, Coca-Cola, sugary beverages. I was the main architect behind Italy's sugar tax. And, and then I went on to education. I made it illegal for schools in Italy to have junk food, to have vending machines. And I made it clear that schools have to have healthy food for all the reasons you have mentioned, not just because it's important for, the, uh, for people's health, but also because it's important for the education of the younger generations that you start thinking um, in 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 um, in those in those terms from the very early on, Italy made um, mandatory to study climate change and sustainability from grade one. Now, Italy was the first country in the world that now once a week spends one hour doing what we call green civic education, civic education based on what you can do practically to help solve the problem. Greta Thunberg and many others were very happy. Pope Francis invited me to uh, to study and all of that. And then everyone fought against me, you know, like big newspapers came against me, uh, the big corporations, Nestle and Coca-Cola came against me, the big oil companies came against me, even the National Army came against me because at some point I even said that um, they wanted to appoint a, a, a general to the head of the Italian Space Agency. And I said that Italy didn't need more soldiers, but needed more scientists. And I thought the space agency should be in the hands of a scientist. So everyone came against me. And then, you know, it was very hard. I probably made this mistake. I thought that a politician alone could make a difference. And if you don't really have a movement behind you, if you don't have other politicians, social movements, opinion makers to help you, you're probably gonna hit, hit the wall. Um, but, the spin-offs were incredible. Now, globally, there is a movement that wants to make the Italian uh, example, the you know teaching green civic ed, 
uh, mandatory in all countries around the world. Um, New Zealand has joined the cause. Mexico has joined the cause. President Biden has mentioned it. Um, the G20 is going to probably come out with a statement next week in favor of uh, mandatory green civic education in, in all countries. So it's 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 really a systems right you never know whether what you do was going to be successful in the medium in the, immediately in the in the short term but may have repercussions and 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 um, indirect impacts uh, globally um I, I also also want to say something about you know i see some questions here if i have a minute some questions around the strategy and you know mark rightly said you guys haven't mentioned the word capitalism and and i'm happy you did it so i want to make it very clear since the very beginning when i started um, writing about GDP and the well-being economy, this was almost 10 years ago, I, it, it came clear to me that if we were going to get stuck into, into the usual debate, capitalism versus alternatives to capitalism, socialism, and so on and so forth, we, we're not going to make a lot, of, a lot of progress. First of all, historically, communism, socialism, capitalism, they're all obsessed with growth. I mean, the, the, the aberrations caused by socialism, socialism's obsession with growth uh, are in really, really, you know, you could, you could fill books and libraries with that. But also because if you want to fight capitalism successfully, you shouldn't let capitalists, capitalists realize that. You need to give them, you need to produce a language that somehow confuses them, that makes them understand, that doesn't portray you as the enemy immediately. If, if, if they portray you as the enemy, they're gonna kill you in the cradle from day one. If you're creating something that can actually bring a lot of entrepreneurs on your side, I want to get entrepreneurs to practice the well-being economy. I want to get people to say, you know what? I want to be a new generation entrepreneur. I want my company to be a well-being company. I want to create value for me and create value for society. If we think that we're all going to change the economy by simply relying on either a new, you know, a, a, an old-fashioned political ideology and or the goodwill of NGOs and, and cooperatives and so on and so forth, we're not going to go far. We need everyone to come on board and we need the language. We need concepts that are can travel. That's why I'm also happy that Yannick has mentioned that. I think the, count, the concept of well-being can be easily translated into a, different, a lot of indigenous languages. I mean, I lived for 20 years in South Africa. Gina can confirm that. Ubuntu, which is one of the main indigenous connotations of the South African culture, is exactly what we mean by well-being. The Buendidir in, in South America, the Lagom culture in, in Sweden, the self-sufficiency concept in Buddhism, and so on and so forth. So you find a lot of interesting, if you will, local cultural connotations that speak to the concept of well-being, to the integration between, um, between social human and environmental between, between these things. And I think if, if we do not embark on this new journey, but we go back to the old fashioned categories, we're gonna simply replicate and repeat the 1960s and the 1970s all over again without, without you know, taking that leap, that qualitative leap that can make this time the right time. Thank you. In the last couple minutes here, I'm gonna pass over um, to Amanda, who's gonna give us a little bit of a wrap. Um, thank you so much, everyone. I know we didn't have, I'm glad that, yeah, there, I hope everyone enjoyed the session. Um, and if you have any questions, do like additional questions, write them in the chat and maybe we can answer them offline in a, in a, as we do a wrap up blog. So thank you all so much. Um, and Amanda, if you wanna give us a bit of a close. Absolutely. Well, um, yeah, I think what you were just saying, Lorenzo, is a really wonderful sort of way to end this journey that we've been on together. I know that for this group as well, you know, when we started with this brief that we needed to focus on the positive, right? Like not just focus on the problems in these areas, but really try to find case studies and examples and proposals for how we can sort of move forward um, and promote these co-beneficial approaches. That wasn't easy, right? There's a lot of information out there on what the challenges and the issues are in these spaces. But, you know, for me personally, I remember it was a few years ago um, when all of the reports were coming out about the environmental apocalypse and, you know, um, the biodiversity loss. I had a moment of just feeling deep nihilism. Yeah, of like, what's the point? And so I think it's really important for us to be both aware of the challenges, but to find hope 
um, because with hope, then we can we can build movements, right? And and I really appreciate your honesty as well, Lorenzo, of recognizing that you know no individual, no matter what the position, can make this change. It's about building a movement, and so this is a community that we've built here to help come together to be a part of that movement and to be able to stand as a voice and a support for the kind of shifts that are needed. And so I just really want to just applaud and thank the authors of this paper. Um, it's been such an honor to witness the collaboration and the grace and the discussions by which you've, you came together to, to work on this um, and to see and to witness the ripples that are already happening on the basis of that work um, around the world. And so we're gonna be having another event soon where we're gonna invite representatives from the different case studies um, that are referenced in the paper to really speak about those concrete um, sort of examples and experiences of <clears throat> promoting innovations in this space. So the date hasn't yet quite been set, but please keep an eye out for that. Um, and so yes, big thanks to the authors. Thank you so much Lorenzo for taking the time to be with us here today. And thank you all to the WE ALL community for your continuous support and engagement in this movement. And I wish you all a wonderful weekend and I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, bye.